kindness you have poured out. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Holy Trinity. Uh, why don't you grab a seat? And uh, if you're watching online, a warm welcome to you. We pray that uh, you would know uh, the blessing of the Lord with you uh, this day. Uh, If you're watching on Facebook, make sure you say uh, hello to us and where you're from on there and uh, so we can reply back and we can pray for you guys. Um, We're here to worship God, and there's a a wonderful verse uh, in the book of Hebrews, which is our studies over uh, over the next few months, and uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, we read, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire." And uh, that can be quite a fearful thing if you're an enemy of God, if we're walking against God, and that, 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 that's a fire that, uh, uh, that, that purifies uh, and can destroy. But for those who look to Jesus, that fire is something that changes our lives and sets our souls on fire uh, for Him. And we want to be on fire for Jesus this day and to hear from Him. And we're here to worship God. It says, worship God with reverence and with awe. In other words, there is a way to come to God. I know people say, just, well, just come as you are. Uh, we come to Jesus just as we are. But when we come to worship, we come with reverence. God, you're so amazing. You're so glorious. I humble myself before you. I want to hear from you. You are the king. You're God. I'm not. I bow before you and I worship you today. So let's worship God. Let's stand together and worship our God is our consuming fire.
Amen. Amen. What a wonderful song. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. We're coming before this amazing God. And we're reminded of those words of Scripture that we just start the service with. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The Lord Jesus Christ said that when he moved in his miracle working power, that uh, when people were healed and uh, set free from demonic oppression, that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, was within us. And Lord, that's the kingdom we're receiving right now. It's a future kingdom, but also there's a reality right now that we are receiving something inside of us that cannot be shaken. And we come before you this morning knowing, Lord, how easily we're shaken in our own bodies. Lord, sometimes our hands tremble when we go to do the things you've called us to do. And sometimes, Lord, our hearts shake and tremble when we hear all the awful things that are going on in the world around us and feel so helpless. But thank you that we have something that cannot be shaken, placed within us. Your kingdom come. And Lord, we pray that this morning, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for what an incredible kingdom it is, that it invites in sinners, those who've messed up, those who felt far from God, and you bring us close, and you take us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of the Son whom you love, Father. And we want to proclaim our love for Jesus today, for all he is and all he has done for us. Thank you. We forever sing your praises that You've loved us from the start. You became one of us. You, be, you became flesh and blood and went all the way to Calvary's cross in order that we might be forgiven so that we might inherit the kingdom of heaven to all who will believe in you. And so, Lord, with whatever gift of faith you've given us today, Lord, may we put our trust in you and not in man. May we not put our trust in our own resources, but in heaven's resources that are available to us today. And Lord, we lift up our prayers this morning in our hearts for all that we're worried about, maybe those that are trembling in fear for their lives, whether it is people in that poor nation of Afghanistan right now and the mess that's been left behind. We pray for that fledgling tiny church that meets there, Lord, so tiny, so vulnerable. Lord, would you protect them by your holy hand? Would you work miracles and wonders and signs among them? and turn a whole nation to you. And Lord, for those in our own families, Lord, as we, as we hear of just so many in our own church as well with uh, COVID-19 and having to isolate and uh, with everyone going back to school, it's just so many illnesses and colds and, uh, that just keeps us apart from one another. We pray for your healing balm, Lord. We pray for your protection over us and over our lives, Lord. There's been so much death around over these past few months, even in our midst here, Lord, at Holy Trinity. Many beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, have gone to be with you. And though we can rejoice in that, those of us who are left are left sad, Lord, um, because we miss them. And so we turn to you this morning, asking you to come and be Holy Spirit comforter in our lives, for we need your help. And so bless all that we do today as we worship, as we hear your word, as we sing praises to your name. Come and meet with us. Bless the work of our hands, just as the psalmist said, that it might bring good fruit as we remain in Jesus. And hear us now as we say that precious prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, as we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen, amen, amen. Um, there are a, a number of notices and uh, uh, 
you can tell her a number when I get my phone out. And, uh, um, but uh, as you all know, uh, our dear sister Linda Allen uh, passed away uh, a few weeks ago and went to be with the Lord. And tomorrow we're going to be having uh, uh, the funeral. It's, uh, the family have requested that it's all going to be at Morton Hall. Uh, so don't come to Holy Trinity by mistake. 11 a.m. Um, to, tomorrow morning, you'll see a wee picture up of, uh, of Linda there on the, on the screen. She was such a, a dear, faithful woman of Christ. She, she, she was a follower of Jesus from her teenage years here at Holy Trinity, and we want to really honor her life uh, tomorrow at Morton Hall, 11 a.m., and if you can be there, please do come along. Um, just to let you know, um, we're coming up to sort of harvest time, and um, we generally always have a harvest offering. Uh, usually, we would use that to um, invest in some local uh, missions and charities that are working to support our own community nearby. Um, but this year, as we met as elders, we felt uh, we were just so struck by the images we're seeing in Afghanistan and many who are being made uh, refugees and the support that's needed there. So this year, our appeal is going to uh, go to support those um, who are needing support, living in other countries and uh, supporting them, uh, as is our Christian duty. And uh, so if you want to give to that, um, the notice, notices before, if you look at the service online, has the exact details of how you can give to that. And uh, if you need to know uh, Janet or Ian, I'll give you the details of the numbers that you need to do to make a transfer for that. Um, and, if, and if you can't do that by bank transfer and you just want to give cash, then speak to Ian or Janet and we'll make special arrangements uh, for that. Um, last week, you got a big. We had a big uh, notice about the weekend away, and we're really excited about that. Um, it's already full, so um, so we're really so, which is great. And um, so, just to let you know, I'm sorry if that it disappoints some of you. And you you were, got, you were thinking, will I? Will I not? And we, I think, all the beds are taken um, already. Um, but we are trying to make the opportunity that people could come as uh, as a day guest and come and join with us and that. And if that is something. Uh, you'd be interested. Let uh, let Joe Black know. Joe's giving a wee wave over there. Just let her know. I'd be interested to hear more if that is possible. Um, and uh, if you need to be on a waiting list as well, and you're really keen to go, we could always put you on a waiting list as well. Um, but we're really excited about going away at the end of um, October. Um, our annual stated meeting is tomorrow night. 7.30 on Zoom. Uh, the link was sent out on the church email, but there may be one or two who don't receive the church email. And uh, if, you, um, if you want to get that link, uh, come and see me at the end of the service. I'll, get, I'll give it to you, or you can um, email the church office and we'll send that, uh, Rita will get that sent straight out to you so you can join online tomorrow night. Uh, what's an ASM? We basically uh, talk about the things that have been going on over the past year, uh, looking at the finance financial situation of the church and uh, giving thanks for all the work that's gone on and some of the plans that we've got for the coming year uh, and how we plan to do that. And it's a really encouraging meeting. So if you want to come along, everyone who's part of Holy Trinity or a member of Holy Trinity is very welcome um, to that. Um, also to let you know that um, we're looking forward to the cafe reopening. And uh, that's been a big miss for, for so many, and not having a cafe to meet together. We haven't been able to do that for a, uh, for a while. And uh, we're going to be opening on the 22nd of September. That's the Wednesday. And it'll just at the beginning open for coffee and cake and, and that type of fellowship. And the team will be around and there'll be a chance to chat with people. And so we'll be doing that for the first couple of months. Um, but we're also right at this moment, um, we're very excited to announce that we've received funding for a new cafe manager. Uh, so that's really exciting, and we've just advertised that. It's just gone up. You'll see it on the church uh, website, the church Facebook page. We want to encourage you to share that post. on. Fa if you're someone who goes on Facebook and uh, on social media, just share the link and that. We want as many people to see that. We want someone, uh, a man or a woman of faith, uh, who really wants to come into that uh, and, uh, and to manage, that, uh, manage the cafe. And just please pray as uh, we go through that process uh, advertising for a cafe manager. And maybe that's something that God's putting on your heart as well, and you need to consider that. So that's available uh, online as well. And then finally, um, this evening, um, 
quite a number of people have been asking me, when are we doing evening services? And uh, we've, been, uh, we've been thinking about that. And we began to think about it as a session. Uh, that's the group of elders that meet together in the church. And uh, as we thought about that, we felt it'd be so good just to meet together on a Sunday evening, half past six, to worship together, to pray together during the, uh, during the month of September as we work up to a full evening service. So it won't be a full service in terms of the way it's been in the past. Um, it's going to be very free, very open, very uh, welcoming for you to bring something, for us to share things we haven't been able to do uh, maybe in the morning because we're broadcasting live. It's not going to be broadcast. Um, things to share testimonies with one another, share scriptures, share words of knowledge, prophecies with one another, um, to hear from uh, God's word and uh, just to enjoy being together and to worship God. So if you want to be part of that and you want to press into God, and that's what we're going to be doing tonight, just pressing uh, into God and allow the wind of the Spirit to come and move over us. And you've missed that, then come along tonight at uh, half past six um, this evening. I think that's all the notices. There's quite a few. This, this, is, this is Holy Trinity, back to normal notices. And uh, I used to think, why, why were we always so long in our services before? And uh, notices. That's <laughs> but they're all really good things and that just God is, uh, God is moving. And uh, maybe just finally, just to say just a big thank you to those of you um, who were praying for me while I was up in Stornoway last week, up at Martin's Memorial Church doing their communion season. It was, uh, we just had a really uh, wonderful time together. Um, those of you who've never been up to Stornoway is that during the communion season is a bit like a conference and uh, you have services on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you have fellowships after church. And it's really a, uh, an amazing time uh, together. And it really was. Um, a young girl, 16, she gave her heart to Jesus. And uh, what was really wonderful, the next night, um, because that's your opportunity to become a member of the church uh, in that tradition. And uh, the next night, both the girl who'd become a Christian and her mum, who was already a Christian, who was waiting for her daughter to come to Christ before she would become a member of the church, they both came forward together. And it was just such a wonderful just sense of God uh, in the midst of that. So we praise God for that. And thanks for those of you who texted me saying I'm praying for you because I certainly need those, uh, need those prayers and need your prayers. Um, and I so value that. Let's turn to God's Word. And uh, if you've got a Bible with you, we're going to be lo uh, looking at Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, we're still early on in Hebrews, so we're still, we're still introducing things. Um, uh, and let's, let's listen to the Word of God. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will." It's not to angels that he subjected the world to come, about which we're speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am, am I, and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. 
and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. And for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Amen. May God add his own blessing to that reading of his own holy and inspired word. There's much in that chapter, and we're not going to be able to cover it all, but we're going to be looking at it in a short while. But let's first uh, come before God, and Janet's going to lead us in praise and worship.
every breath I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so good.
that song. It's a glorious thought, isn't it? If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, Let's pray as we come to God's Word and uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Father God, we come to your precious Word. Thank you for the way you've spoken to us in the past through your Word. Thank you for the way that you will speak to us today and the way you will speak to us in the future because, uh, Lord, when you plant your Word in our hearts, Lord, it bears fruit into future and to future generations as we share that Word with others. And so we pray with that in mind that the speaker would decrease so that Jesus Christ of Nazareth would increase, for we ask it in his holy name. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 2, um, first few verses there. We must uh, pay the most careful attention then to what we've heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape If we ignore so great a salvation, this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, if uh, Hebrews chapter 1 is all about uh, Jesus' divinity that He is divine. He is the eternal Son of God. Uh, He's the one through whom God has spoken to the world. He is the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of God on earth. That's what the the wording is. And He is sustaining all things by His powerful Word. He's sustaining every atom and gluon and quark in the universe, Jesus is sustaining that right now. In other words, what Jesus does is the, the, the very government of God, what the reformers call this is what God sustains. Jesus says he does that, and it's pointing towards the Trinity. And so as we look at Hebrews 1, we immediately see just how great Jesus is as the eternal Son of God, superior to all the angels, and some of those angels are very superior (laughs) indeed, but Jesus is superior to all that. And if that's what chapter 1 is about, then chapter 2 is definitely about Jesus' humanity, His humanness. But before the, the writer of Hebrews gets into that, he takes a little excursion because he really wants to drive home the point of why he is writing this at all. And we read it there in chapter 2, verse 1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. So he's saying this is why we need to pay attention to the words of Hebrews is that we don't drift away from God. I want you just to imagine there's a little boat up there on the screen, and I just want you to imagine, we go to the, the former one, I just want you to imagine you, you see the boat there, it looks so idyllic, so peaceful, doesn't it? And you just step into the boat and you think, oh, I could do with a wee rest. And you just take a wee lie down in the boat. What could be better? The waves lap in the shore and you begin to drift off into a deep... Don't do it right now, I'm preaching. And I, and I do that later. But just imagine, you're just drifting off and it's so peaceful. And then all of a sudden you, you wake up and all around you the situation is very different. You're actually miles, miles from shore, miles from rescue, and a wind, fierce wind is coming in, a storm's coming in, the waves are getting higher and higher, and you're in danger of being shipwrecked. And this is the picture we have within the Scriptures of our Christian lives when we drift away from God. You see, it's actually very rare. It does happen, but it's very rare that somebody just wakes up one day and goes, I don't believe any of this anymore. Or somebody wakes up and goes, I'm not going, I'm never going to church ever again. What tends to happen is that people slowly begin to drift away. It's very subtle. It's much more subtle in our lives um, we, we tend to think, well, I won't pray today. 
or I won't read God's word today, or I don't need to go to church today. And no one will know anyway because you can watch it online. And I'll just tell them I watched it online even though I didn't watch it online. And slowly we begin to drift and drift away. And suddenly we can find ourselves in quite a serious situation where rescue seems very unlikely and we're going to shipwreck our faith. I was talking to somebody this week about that very thing. And they were actually sharing a testimony uh, with me of how after their, their father died uh, many, many years ago, um, they suddenly thought, they felt so terrible about that, that, and it was so awful that they thought, this Christian life doesn't work. But they said in their, in their, in their heart, I won't stop going to church straight away. I'll, I'll just miss, I'll just miss, I'll, go now, I'll still go now and again. I'll just, I'll just, this is, that, that's sort of drifting. And God came gracious, graciously and amazingly just restored that person. But that, that is repeated a thousand times right across Scotland where we can just end up, what the scriptures say, we can just drift away. You see, it's the difference between what's going on on the surface and what's going on underneath. I don't know if you've ever stood at the shore and, and have you noticed how the waves lapping the shore, they're always coming towards you. <laughs> you never see them at the shore going away from you. <laughs> you. They always look like they're coming towards you. And that's true even if the, the tide's coming in or the tide's going out. It always looks like the waves are coming in always coming into shore. And so we can be lulled into this false sense of, of security that, that I can drift and I won't go too far. I'll be okay. But unless our anchors are down in Jesus, unless we're anchored down in Christ and in his church, which remember is his body here on earth, unless our, we're anchored down in the word of God, his word of truth, then the danger is we're just going to drift away because there can be powerful currents underneath that are much more powerful than those little waves <laughs> lapping against the shore. Underneath what's going on are powerful currents that the enemy uses to drift and drag people away from Jesus. Currents of unbelief. Currents of maybe worst of all, currents of pride where we can believe, I don't need them, and them meaning other Christians. And that pride gets in. It's the worst sin of all. It was the sin of Satan that we think, I can do okay on my own. I'll be fine. And all of a sudden, the current grabs you. And suddenly, you're far, far away from shore. And so, the writer of Hebrews says, this is why I'm writing this. This is why I'm writing it. Right at the, the, the very final few verses in the book of Hebrews, you'll read uh, in verse, um, uh, in, sorry, in chapter tw uh, 13, verse 22. He says, brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. And so if you look up the dictionary definition of an exhortation, this is, this is what it says, an address or communication emphatically urging someone to do something. So this letter of Hebrews is emphatically urging you to do something. And what's that? That you pay attention to it so that you do not drift away. So I'm excited about getting into the book of Hebrews because it's going to prevent that and prevent us drifting away. Away and and if um, and if you're feeling that and, th and thinking, well, that's actually a word that I'm feeling. Don't take it as a condemnation, but God's grace to you today to say, well, He knows this, and He's reminding you. Get anchored down in the Word of God. Get get anchored down in this book of Hebrews, and see what God has to say to you. It's really exciting. You remember last time that uh, I, I said to you that uh, if I could go back in time to any t any period. I would go back to the road to Emmaus when Jesus, the risen Jesus, walked along with those two disciples and he spoke to them and they didn't know who he was at first and we read that he told them everything that was written in the law and the prophets about him. 
And I, I said, I want to go back to, I'd love just walk along to be with the risen Jesus here on earth and to hear him preaching the word, the greatest preacher of all, <laughs> and, and actually telling you what, what that, and, and, I, and I actually said that this is the closest we, we get, the book of Hebrews, to that. We get all these wonderful verses of the Old, Old Testament, which, remember, is the Bible that Jesus used. And here we find the, these verses being used to show us who Jesus is, that it's pointing towards Jesus, the Messiah. Now, without getting all technical uh, on you, the, a theologian and theologians, they'll tell you about these things, and they'll tell you that these passages in the Old Testament, the Bible Jesus read, that point to Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of God who would come to rescue his people, they are named messianic passages, messianic scriptures. You maybe even heard of that. But there's a problem with that, and I have a problem with it because there's a question that accompanies that in my head. How do you know which passages are messianic, pointing to Jesus, and which are not? How do, how do we tell the difference? And I've been studying the Scriptures since I was a teenager, and I love uh, the Word of God. Uh, not many days have gone by where I've not been in the Word of God in some, in some way since I was a teenager, and I cannot find a satisfactory, I've not found one yet, a satisfactory answer to that question, although I could give you lots of clues to point you towards that. So I'm a very simple person, and, and I hope it'd be helpful me sharing this, that I'm a, quite a simple person. I just assume all of it is messianic, that all of it can, could potentially point towards Jesus as the Holy Spirit shows you. We were at the Wednesday night prayer meeting this week. Um, I shared with uh, those who had come to pray, I shared with them a devotion. I said that it was the, the, the weirdest daily devotional I've ever read in my life that I found helpful. And it was a devotion about sweat. <laughs> Stinking sweat. And it traces how right from the beginning uh, in Genesis, when uh, after Adam falls, and God comes to speak to him in the fall. He sinned and disobeyed God. And God pronounces there's a curse over his work. And he says, by the sweat of your brow, you'll bring forth fruit from the earth. And it starts to tell us about why is work so hard sometimes? Why is our daily work a grind? You know, why is it a grind? It's by the sweat of your brow. And, and so the Bible speaks through sweat about our work. And then through this devotional, he starts tracing sweat through the Bible and how it shows us not just about God's work, but about Christ's work and what he came to do, leading all the way up into the Garden of Gethsemane, where it tells us that Jesus was sweating drops of blood as he made his way to the cross. And so I tell you, I, I'm only repeating that. And I know I was talking about it on, on the prayer meeting. I'm repeating it because if God can point to Jesus, in his word, through sweat. Anything is potentially something that could, by the Holy Spirit, actually show us something about Jesus as we read the Bible Jesus read, as we read the Old Testament scriptures. But there's also another way that might be helpful as well, and you can do what I, because I find it so hard to say, well, which one is and which one isn't, and, and they ask you about that in university. And so you could do what I do, and... Whenever I read a verse from the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament pointing us to Jesus, what I'll do is a very simple thing. If you've got a modern translation of the Bible, any translation worth its salt, you'll notice every time it quotes a verse in the Bible, it gives you a little mark and it tells you exactly where it is. And so you can do what I do and you can look up that verse, but I don't just look up the verse. If it's in a psalm, I'll just read the whole psalm. Or if it's in the prophets, I'll see where the verse is and I'll read the chapter that's around it. Or if I see that it's in the book of the law, I'll look at the section of the law that it's in and read that section. And I'm asking myself one question. I'm saying, is there anything here that might point me towards the Messiah? 
God's chosen one. Is there anything here that, that the Holy Spirit would draw my attention to so I can get to know Jesus better? Because Hebrews is all about doing that and taking these verses, sometimes obscure verses of Scripture. So really quickly, let me do that just for the, the first verse we find in Hebrews that's quoted in the Old Testament, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them, and just show you just how easy that is. So we read in verse 5, uh, chapter 1, we read, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. And you look at the little reference and you see, that's from Psalm chapter 2. I'll look up Psalm chapter 2, not too difficult to find, right in the middle of the Bible. And you just re look at there and, uh, and you check it's not Psalm 119 because that'll take you an hour to read. And um, we see Psalm chapter 2 and you go, oh, it's got 12 verses. I can read 12 verses. <laughs> and it's verse 7. You are my son. Today I've become your father. But I don't just want to read that verse. I want to read the psalm. And I want to be asking this question. Is this pointing me to Jesus? So let's read it. And I'll just stop as we go through. And you ask the Holy Spirit as we read it, is there something that comes into my mind? Because if you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit to help you to do this. And you might think of things that I haven't thought of. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Now, immediately I'm reading that and going, the New Testament considers this passage messianic. It points to Jesus. And I'm reading here, immediately read the word, the Lord and his anointed and immediately my ears are pricking up because I'm going well that's what Messiah means anointed one that's what Christ in it means both in Hebrew and Greek Christ is the Greek form of Messiah and Hebrews the sorry Messiah is Hebrew and Christ is Greek and they both mean anointed one anointed by God and so I'm reading about this is the Lord Yahweh's anointed one and it says about him in that verse that the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. And immediately I'm thinking, did that happen? Well, it did. Even in Jesus' birth, <laughs> you had King Herod the Great ready to destroy the baby Jesus and destroyed many young, young kids. And even in Jesus' death, as he was going to the cross, what do we read about? We read about the rulers at that time. We read about Herod. It was a different Herod um, at that time and uh, Herod the Great had died. Um, there's Herod, and there's um, Pilate, and there's the high priest, the, ru the religious rulers, uh, Caiaphas. They all banded together. It tells us that they became friends. They were formerly enemies, and they became friends to conspire against Jesus, Messiah. So immediately I'm reading this and going, yeah, it's pointing towards something that we know happened, and we can see it's pointing towards Jesus. Let's read on. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And so he's speaking about his anointed one, and he's a king. That's the first thing. And he also says that I've installed him on Zion. And if you've read any of the Bible, you'll know what Zion is. Zion is the city of our God. It's the, the city of Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem that is to come. And so whoever this anointed one is, he's going to center around Jerusalem. And where did Jesus' ministry and his ultimate sacrifice center around? Around Jerusalem. I'm, I'm just going over the server. There's much more we can say about that. Uh, verse 7, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. And so whoever this chosen one of God, this anointed one of God, this king that God uh, has decreed, um, the Lord said, you are my son. Today, 
I've become your father. So whoever this is, it's, it can't just be David because God now is talking about family. And we'll come to that in a few moments. Ask me, verse 8, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Again, this psalm is speaking about King David in the human terms, but it must be wider than David because it says, I'll make the nations your inheritance. The end. This this kingly rule, this Messiah is not just going to encompass Israel, it's going to encompass the whole earth to the very ends of the earth. It's going to encompass all nations. He's going to be rule and judge over all nations. Verse 10, therefore you kings be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son Or he will be angry and your way will lead to destruction for his his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. There's an interesting phrase there, kiss his son or kiss the son. That's interesting. In Hebrew, um, that's another way of saying worship. That's what it means. And in the Greek translation in the Septuagint, it also means worship. So whoever this king is, whoever this Messiah is, even though they're human, yet they are to be worshipped. And now we're getting into the mysteries of the Trinity. So even in one verse that is quoted in the book of Hebrews, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens, you can get so much just by looking up where the passage is, where the psalm is, where the, the prophet speaks, where the, the, the book of the law is in that. Let's, I don't want to labor that point, um, but let's, uh, let's read on. Um, verse 5 in chapter 2 of Hebrews. It's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we're speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? a son of man, that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death. For everyone. So now we're getting into chapter two. We're seeing the humanity of Jesus that he had to, uh, though he was fully divine and fully God according to chapter one, yet he came and experienced death. How could God die? Now there's an interesting thing about this because if you've got a modern version of the, uh, of the Bible, you'll see as we read this uh, verse from the Old Testament, which is actually from um, Psalm eight, um, what is man that you're mindful of them? that if you've got a modern, most modern translations will try to ha- include gender neutral language. And the reason they do that is they want to make sure that you know that whether you're a man or a woman, you are included in this. And so when the Apostle Paul, uh, when he writes a letter, and he says, um, greetings to all you brothers in Ephesus or greetings to all the brothers in Thessalonica or whatever he says. He uses a Greek word, adelphoi, and it doesn't just mean the men. The Greek word adelphoi actually refers to all believers in Jesus, both men and women. But the way they would say that was brothers. And so when, when you open your Bible nowadays, just as this version, NIV version, uh, it will not say just to the brothers. It will say, greetings to you, brothers and sisters. And that's really good because uh, we don't want anyone to be confused that somehow you're going to get left out, (laughs) that actually it does include you. It's just the way they said things in those days. But there is a danger. You knew there was a but. (laughs) There is a danger in doing that. Um, because here we read 
how these, this gender-neutral language is used about Psalm 8. And Psalm 8 is clearly about human beings. What is mankind that you're mindful of them? The original says, what is man that you are mindful of him? You probably know that if you grew up in church because that's the way it's always been said. The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels and you crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. And it's clearly talking about human beings. And so the translators helpfully put them in so that you know it includes you and it includes me. But here's the danger. That this is also not just talking about you and me. It's also talking about Jesus. And we know that through 1 Corinthians 15, 27. You can look that up when you go home. And so when we change the language, we rightfully make it clearer that it's about you and me. And that's good. But we could obscure the fact that it is also about God's Messiah, about the one who was to come, Jesus Christ. And so I just want to put a little asterisk, because I'm generally I'm in favor of making sure language is as inclusive as possible to make sure people know that they are included in the promises of the Bible, because that it does mean that. But we must tread very carefully because gender neutral language is not always neutral. Because we read about the Son of Man that you care for him, or the Son of or a Son of Man that you care for them. Son of Man is not neutral within Bible. It can refer just to human beings. But you and I know that in books like the book of Daniel. When a son of man turns up, while Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the middle of the fiery flames that Nebuchadnezzar have thrown them into, there is a son of man who appears there protecting them and bringing them out of the fire completely unharmed. And we know that son of man is Jesus, the eternal son of God. Jesus himself called himself the son of man. So we just have to be careful and tread carefully with language. Verse 10, sorry. Uh, there's, so much, there's so much in this uh, chapter. And hopefully um, some of these introductory sermons on Hebrews will just help us as we go through just to delve more into the verses individually. Verse 10, in bringing, and I just want you, as I read the next uh, few verses, I just want you to hear the language of family that is used about you and me and about Jesus. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. These are amazing verses, but did you notice the language that's used? It talks about us being sons and daughters, being brought to glory. It says that both the one who makes people holy, that's Jesus through his body sacrificed on the cross, Hebrews 10.10, and the ones who are made holy, that's you and me when we put our trust in Jesus and his cross are of the same family. Jesus is not ashamed to call you, ones that call sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. 
And, and Jesus proclaims, I'll declare your name to my brothers and sisters. But he also says, here am I and the children God has given me. So do you see the paradox here that, that this Messiah, this Jesus, is both able to call you his brothers and sisters. He's able to call you family through what he did on the cross in making you holy and you're made holy in him. And he's also able to call you sons and daughters. So how is all that possible? How, is, how can Jesus call you brothers and sisters? And how can he call you sons and daughters? And how can he call you generally just family? And here is the mystery of salvation. And here's the mystery in the, the Trinity. That the government of heaven is family. That is the way God has ordered things. It's not just the way God has ordered things on earth. It's the way God has ordered things in heaven. And you've been brought into that family as sons and daughters and brothers and sisters of Jesus. And that's really difficult to get your head around sometimes. But one of the things that we do see in our society today is that the family has come under attack. And history shows us that the most successful building blocks of any society is the family. I was um, hearing a speech made by um, the, uh, the historic Scottish historian and TV presenter, Neil Oliver. You'll have seen him. He, he does loads of uh, TV programs, and he has his long hair, and uh, he's got a great Scottish voice. And this is what, this is what he said. And um, he's, not a, he's not a Christian that I'm aware of, but he's, this is what he said. Down through history, one totalitarian regime after another, one ideology after another, has identified the family as the fundamental building block of society and thereby the most stubborn stumbling block on the road to establishing their brave new worlds. Those regimes that seek more and more control over the lives of its citizens always seek to undermine the family. This is a Scottish historian looking back right throughout history. And if people want to rule you, they'll start destroying the family. It should concern us as Christians greatly that within the Scottish Parliament, they're willing to pass laws that would allow four-year-olds to be referred over gender reassignment without reference to the parents. That should concern us greatly. It should concern us greatly that in Westminster, they're willing to consider vaccinating 12-year-olds to 18-year-olds. Not the fact that they're vaccinating them, but that that will be enforced without parental consent. And Neil Oliver was saying, history shows us. History shows us. It's not that they shouldn't get vaccinated. Don't hear me wrong. It's that when we decide to bypass the parents and bypass the family. It is eroding the fundamental building block of every successful society in history. And the reason why it's successful is that the government of heaven is family. And governments get in between parents and their law-abiding children at their peril and to the peril of their society. Let me finish with a, a glorious thought here because we're running out of time. Verse 14, we've just read it. We don't want to come between parents and their flesh and blood. It's their flesh and blood. But verse 14 says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. I love this verse. That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. This has been my go-to verse ever since early on in my time at Holy Trinity. A woman came to the door there banging on the door and I opened the door and I said, can I help you? And she said, I need to see a minister. And I said, I'm a minister, and she said, I don't look like a minister. But uh, uh, um, it was early days. 
I've, I've grown the minister belly now, but um, it was slim then. And, uh, but she came to the door, she said, I need to speak to a minister. And I said, I'm a minister. You can talk to me. And she said, I need, I need to speak to you. I'm terrified of dying. That's kind of our opening line. I'm terrified of dying. And um, I just remember going, oh, what's that verse? <laughs> what's that? You know when you just know a verse? And you're like, I cannot remember where it was. And I couldn't remember where it was. So I have just imprinted this Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 on my mind now because this is actually really common in our society. People who are in bondage to the fear of death. And this is a wonderful go-to verse because there's a promise here that Jesus, he not only shared our humanity, shared in our life, he shared in our, heart, in our death so that he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's an, that's an, amazing, that's an amazing verse. That, that if that is something that, that holds someone, if, it, if there's someone here who's held by that, I want you to know that that is something that can be broken in the name of Jesus. It's something that, because it's a bondage that holds on to you, being terrified of death, you don't need to be if you're in Jesus. Because he beat death. And we can say without him, you know, <laughs> if he walked out that grave, I'm walking too. This is what we can know through faith in this Jesus who became human for us, who took him upon himself our life, who was tempted in every way like us but without sin. We haven't got time to go into that now. We will in a later week. Jesus who actually took upon himself our death. And if you're living in fear of dying, then come to Jesus today and we're gonna pray, Lord, break that bondage. Break that, that slavery to the fear of death that the, the, the scripture speaks about because you can do this, God. Because God doesn't want you to walk in fear. He wants you to walk in his life, in his resurrection life, in his eternal life. Amen? Somebody wants to go and get the children. We're going to pray. So let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this rich passage full of truth, full of helpfulness, full of things that can help us not to drift away. And so, Lord, we, I want to come to you right now and by your Holy Spirit, Lord, if any one of us, and we, we can all fall into this trap of just getting into the nice boat and thinking everything is all right and not putting the anchors down in you day by day, Thank you that you're a rescuer if we found ourselves further out to sea than we expected to and things are a bit stormy. Lord, come and rescue us and drag us into the shore again. We don't want to be a people who drift. We don't want to be a church that, that just drifts but is ever attentive to your voice and to your leading Holy Spirit. And we thank you for all the rich treasures we have in your word we thank you for, particularly for those verses in, in Hebrews, Lord, that I would never have thought of, uh, of interpreting in that way, that it, I could only know because you reveal it and your word is a re revelation to us. And we thank you that all we can learn about Jesus there, the Messiah, the one you would send, that it might affirm us in our faith and establish us in our faith firmly in him and in no one else because only in Christ can we be saved. We pray for our nation, Lord. We've touched upon just the family being attacked, Lord. And sometimes people want to dismantle it and they feel it's very good reasons they want to do that. But it's destructive. It's destructive to future generations and to our children and to our children's children. And just as we pray on earth as in heaven, we pray for your good governance within our society, Lord. Thank you for the good things that come through our Christian heritage that bless us. And we're still blessed to this day. We're still enjoying the fruits of that, Lord. But if we turn away from the root, we won't get the fruit anymore. 
and all will be left is despair and confusion for future generations about who they are and what you've said they are and what you've called us to be and how you've taught us to live. And we don't want to be in confusion as a nation. And Lord, we bring to you just that last thing, that beautiful thought that Jesus, you fully shared our humanity and you really did die on that cross, Lord. It wasn't some fake death. It wasn't just for sure. You really were dead and buried for three days. And after three days, you rose victorious on that Sunday morning, victorious from the tomb, victorious over sin and death and hell. And Lord, knowing that and putting our trust in you, Lord, when we believe in you, you tell us we share in your death so that we might also share in your life. And so in Christ and through belief in him, the fear of death is taken away. And we come in the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, would you break off any bondages for anyone here or anyone listening to this message, Lord, that that is in bondage to the fear of death. Maybe it's absorbing their thoughts at night. Maybe it's bringing a guilt because someone is a believer in you and they've trusted in you and yet they say, I shouldn't be afraid of this, but I am. Lord, thank you that we can be honest with you and we can say, Jesus, break the chains. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And we plead the shed blood of Jesus over our delicate minds and hearts that can be easily just thrown off by things like that. Help us to see Jesus in all his glory and all his his wonder. Hear as we pray. And just take a moment. Just in silence right now. We'll just leave a few moments. Just as there's something, Lord, you want from today. We've, we've covered a lot of different, it's not just been one topic. There's been a lot of different ones. And I hope that isn't confusing for anyone. But just, Lord, is there something, one thing that I'm to take away today that you want to speak to me about? These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd hope to have the kids back, but they've not turned up, so we're going to worship God. Uh, Let's stand together and let's close uh, with a closing hymn as we worship his name.
with us. Go before us, ancient of days, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all, both today and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for coming uh, this morning, if you're able. Uh, we're meeting at half six tonight just to press into God, and you'll be very welcome if you, if you can. God bless you all. Saints and days. 
Saints and angels that bow before your throne, all the elders cast their crimes before the Lamb of God and sing. Saints and angels, they bow before your throne. All the elders cast their cries before the Lamb of God. 
Glory.